Hello and uh, welcome everyone to the ASCOA virtual living room. 
I hope you, are, you enjoyed our uh, music from uh, the music program at the America Society. My name is Cecilia Tornaghi. I am the managing editor at America's Quarterly. And uh, today we are very proud to be launching our latest special report. Uh, here, just a little glimpse at the, at the cover. It's also available on the website. Uh, open access. And this one will be tackling the topic of uh, supply chains, uh, which went from trade speak to a household topic very, very quickly as people started to see empty shelves, late deliveries. And now it, it is a buzzword in a discussion about nearshoring that has increased in uh, response to, to this event. And that's why uh, we have this incredible panel joining us today for this launch event that is going, they're going to help us answer this question, which is how can we make nearshoring in Latin America a reality? Uh, uh, the issue is being discussed in multiple formats uh, across the board. But what we hope to do here today uh, is to go beyond the wishful thinking of, of a perfect world or uh, uh, how we can fix Latin America as a whole, but to analyze what progress actually has been done uh, so far, what is happening, and, and what are the low-hanging fruits, uh, policies, or realistic take at prospects uh, moving forward. And it is my privilege to have this uh, great panel today to be joined by Jose Antonio Mead, uh, former Secretary of Finance, Public Credit of Mexico, who joins us uh, from that beautiful land today, the beautiful country, and uh, Shannon O'Neill, the Vice President, Deputy Director of Studies and Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations, who in fact wrote our cover story for this edition of America's Quarterly. You don't want to miss it. It's a great, uh, great article, very enlightening. And it's so fantastic to have you both here. Uh, unfortunately, Stanley Mota, who was uh, expected to join us as well, had a family emergency and will not be able to, to join us. So we just uh, wish him all the best. But unfortunately, he won't be able to, to be here. But we have a lot to discuss Anyway, and I have two fantastic people here to help us um, get uh, get a light on it. Before we start, I just wanted to to highlight quickly that uh, your participation is more than welcome. So you can send your questions. You can uh, uh, either tweet at us if you're watching uh, over social media using a hashtag at ASCOA uh, on LinkedIn as well. But of course, here, if you're on the Zoom joining us today, please use the chat function and send, a, send me a message and I'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Um, so thank you very much to both of you to, uh, for being here today. I don't want to take any more time because I want to hear from you. So I actually want to start from you, Shannon, uh, because in your article, you highlight um, um, during this 40 year or so period of, of the globalization, right? When it actually took root and the process really took off. Latin America was sort of like left behind. It was sort of ended up being the losing end of it. Uh, but, you know, of course we do have our exceptions to the rule, which Mexico uh, for most, of course, you know, especially since uh, the NAFTA uh, signing. Uh, but you also mentioned Paraguay, which was able to, to, to double its uh, um, uh, trade as percentage of GDP in the last 20 years or so. So a large and a small economy. Uh, <laughs> and I just wanted to ask you um, under this umbrella, you know, if, are there lessons that we can take from, from these, you know, success stories since they come from so many uh, such different countries? And what would you say that you would like to, to start with as, as far as, you know, framing this, what progress has been done and where can we go from here? Great. Um, well, thank you, Cecilia. And it's a pleasure to be here and always with Jose Antonio. Um, you know, as I think about this and the lessons to be taken, I would just step back even, even further than just Latin America. And I would look broadly at who were the winners of globalization and who were the losers and, and why did they win? And so when you look at the trade data over the last four decades, um, what you find, interestingly, you know, we talk a lot about globalization and we sort of assume it's been this, you know, huge force that's affected everyone around the world, but actually that's not playing out in the trade data. When you look at, at countries that have actually globalized, and the way that I measure this is trade as a percentage <clears throat> of GDP. So trade became a bigger part of their economy. They became more global. There are only about two dozen countries around the whole world that saw trade as a percentage of GDP double or more. And conversely, there are almost 90 countries 
where over the last 40 years, trade as a percentage of GDP, so trade as a part of the economy, either stayed the same or it declined. So they became less global than they were in 1980. Uh, and so what's important, I think, there is one, that globalization was not as broad as we often think when we talk about it, right? It was pretty focused, it was pretty shallow. Um, and those that won, that won globalized, but that also saw GDP per capita grow, they saw themselves climb the socioeconomic scale, they saw, you know, increasing value added in, in terms of their goods and the things that they were sending out to the world in terms of the kinds of jobs they had, you know, many of those in this list of two dozen uh, were those that linked to their neighbors. Um, so regionalization was a big part of this. So if you look at those 24 countries, um, there are some like Paraguay or the UAE that had, you know, natural resources, commodities that made a big difference. Um, but most of them were actually countries that hooked into regional manufacturing hubs. So a lot of Eastern European countries are on that list. Mexico is on that list. Uh, a lot of East Asian countries, the Taiwan, South Korea's. Um, uh, Singapore's and the like are also on that list. Um, and so you see here that when you tie into regional manufacturing hubs, when you are part of the supply chains that have arisen over the last 40 plus years, that's actually a strong path to better growth. Um, and in Latin America, to turn to Latin America, Mexico has done that. Um, and we've seen a little bit other places, but really not a lot. And in fact, when you look at trade, to GDP in most of the countries in the region, it hasn't increased significantly. Mexico, again, the exception, but Paraguay, as you mentioned, but for particular reasons, the rest haven't. Some have even declined. Uh, and what you haven't seen particularly is trade with their neighbors, right? Trade with their neighbors is 20% or less in a lot of places, rather than it being a driving force. And I think that is something that has held back the growth um, and the ability for Latin America to quote unquote win from globalization so far. Yeah, I want to get back to that, to the interregional that you raised. That's very, very interesting. But before there's another uh, 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 sort of like huddle, hurdle here that we haven't crossed yet. And Jose Antonio, that's what you raised on your uh, on your contribution to this to this uh, edition of America's Quarterly, which is the hurdle of education where we left behind. And of course, during COVID, we got the kick all the way to the back uh, of, the, of the trend. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit how do you see that as being this impactful in in the for Latin America to be able to uh, sort of uh, seize this opportunity of this moment of a global crisis in supply chain and and the talk of nearshoring how do you see the education as being a major hurdle in here first thank you Cecilia for having me thank you Shannon it's always a pleasure to 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 share in this participation and this reflection process. I, I want to sort of tackle your question in the context of what Shannon said. I think it's interesting who, when one looks at countries and regions and, and what trade did and how positive trade was in many of those countries and those regions. But it's also interesting to see what trade did within those countries. And I think that, that there, there are things that we learned. If by and large, trade is clearly positive. By, by and large, these globalization and regionalization processes resulted in better access. Uh, and it resulted in, in some very positive trends within our countries, within Latin America and, and, and within Mexico. But not everyone was a winner. Uh, and there was a sense of discontent around the policies that we were pursuing. I think in particular, and uh, we should credit the, this degree of openness uh, for it, uh, Mexico and the region did very well in combating extreme poverty. If you look at 2018 versus 2000 or even beyond, Poverty was at its lowest level, especially extreme poverty. We created a lot of wealth. In Latin America was clearly more wealthy in 2018 than it had been for a very long time. But there was, and there was a lot of discourse about integration. Shannon ended his participation saying not yet. And if you go back six years, integration was a big thing within the Latin American context, right? the Pacific Alliance and dialogue between the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur and reapproachment between the U.S. and Cuba and the peace process in Colombia. All of them sort of signaled uh, as a globalization process that, that was being a dominant topic and a dominant aspiration within the integration process of Latin America. Uh, and you can't really say that that's the case uh, today. And I think that when one looks at what happened within countries, you find the answer as to why nearshoring in order to be positive has to be different than the type of trade that, that, that we had before. There were many people that were not part of the benefits of trade. 
And, and one of the most important distinguishers as to whether or not you were going to be benefited by, by trade is education. In, in Mexico, the difference between finishing high school and not finishing high school is five years of life expectancy. That means that the life expectancy as of somebody that doesn't have education if one of our countries is, is, is so complicated, so difficult that you will that you are actually going to die younger. That gap is actually larger in Chile. It's pretty large also in, in Brazil and in Colombia. So it's large throughout the region. And that is why I think that if we want your globalization to produce or regionalization or nearshoring to produce good results and for that policy to be well anchored in our democracies, that trade process has to do better. It has to be more inclusive. And I think that in particular, in order to get the full benefits of it, we have to invest more heavily in education. I think that that at some point will help the, the regionalization and the possibility to take advantage of nearshoring, but also it will help for the benefits to be more broadly enjoyed by, by master uh, percentages of our population. And I think that's key if we want nearshoring and we want actually the type of policies that support it to take hold and to be seen as beneficial. Yeah, that's one of those long-term uh, um, fixes that we need, right? Because education is not something that you can really unravel from one day to the next, but it has to be started, right? That basically has to kick it off. It has and to be started, and it, it probably is not a, as long-run as an investment. I think you have sort of two challenges. You have a flow issue, and you have a, like a historical issue. In Mexico, there's 44 million people that did not finish high school, 44 million adults. Only about 35 million did. So I think there's two challenges. First, we need to make sure that people that are of age stay within the formal system. But the, 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 the adults that did not stay within the formal system, and I think that COVID is going to, to have, I think, some, some positive uh, unintended consequences. The fact that we have seen how decentralized we can become in terms of disseminating information and, and just this seminar that we're having today and, and its far reach implications. So all of that technological change should be done and should be used to the benefit of those adults who, 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 who we can't just give up on and we need probably to train and, and to give them the skills necessary to participate more successfully in, in, in the supply chains. And at the same time, we have a region that has a lot of very innovative um, industries and an incredible booming fintech uh, sector and other areas uh, of sorts. And we've seen uh, some, I saw the Tata, the, uh, the uh, Indian global company, but it's an Indian um, IT provider who is expanding in Ecuador uh, to provide for the region. So, uh, Shannon, what do you see as the... Um, the actual the low-hanging fruit here so to speak you know where are the areas um in the in the region if, if it's either just central america and and north or south or regional wise i mean where do you see any low-hanging fruits such as those you know pointy examples of tata in ecuador or you know some uh, some other industries that have actually we actually have those in issue as well mm -hmm. have actually decided to invest further um in 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 hubs in region sure um, there definitely is low-hanging fruit um i would just, just step back for a second um you know there's reasons why latin america has sort of lost in this last 40 years and there's reasons right now when over not and not just COVID is accelerating these things, but over the last decade or so, we've seen a real shift in the way global manufacturing has been working for 30, 40 years. And so whether it is because of you know, logistics costs, and you know, we saw that accentuated during the COVID crisis, um, whether it is the effects of climate change, both on transportation, but also on emissions and people trying to lower their emissions. So every extra mile transferred adds an extra cost to, you know, to your bottom line. Uh, whether it is issues of um, geopolitics, uh, we've seen lots of divides there. And so there are particular industries and sectors where certain sets of countries don't want to buy from other sets of countries. And those tend to be the, you know, the regional hubs that have been centers of a lot of this. Um, you know, all of these reasons. Uh, and then finally, because consumers want everything tomorrow and not six weeks from now, which is what it takes to get across the Pacific if something is coming there. So lots of these mean right now at this moment, I do believe we have sort of a once in a generation fluidity to global manufacturing uh, and, and services and, and other kinds of production. And so the question is, where is that going to relocate as it relocates, right? 
Um, and some things we started to see was starting before COVID happening, for instance, consumer electronics, they were starting to relocate far before COVID hit, and that's just accelerated it. Most of it moved from China to Southeast Asia, not to Latin America, but there aren't reasons, there are reasons why it could move more to Latin America, that and particularly other industries. So low hanging fruit, given that there is sort of this fluidity or you know, right now or flexibility that we haven't seen for a couple of decades, I do think there are areas where Western hemisphere in general could pick things up. Some things are, you know, areas or sectors that have been deemed strategic and in the national interest or national security interests of the US, China, though Latin America is less likely to get it from, to be the, the supplier for China there, but the US and Europe and others. So these are things like, uh, critical minerals, you know, the Department of Defense in the US has two dozen critical minerals of which Latin America has reserves in most of them. Um, issues like large capacity batteries, this is electric vehicle batteries and, and all the processing that goes into that. Pharmaceuticals and medical devices, that's something that's come up. Latin America has a base of, of research and also production capacity, so expanding that. Um, so these are areas where I do think there are sectors that there's open for Latin America and some base to be expanded upon. And then the other side is consumer goods uh, and this, you know, lead time, everybody wants their new fast fashion outfit uh, tomorrow, not a long time from now. So it may be more profitable to make it in Central America, the Dominican Republic, Mexico or elsewhere than to make it in, in Bangladesh or Vietnam or other places. So I do think there are areas that are sort of, you know, the very strategic where companies will pay more because governments will incentivize them to do so. Uh, and there's a and they want to put it in places that they feel they have free trade agreements. They have, you know, uh, you know, they're both democracies. They have longstanding, you know, military and other relationships, which most of the Western Hemisphere fits. Um, or they're going to be things where time constraints and others make it, it better and more profitable to, uh, particularly if the U.S. is the final market to, to do it in Latin America. So I think there's a lot of industries there where you'll see the potential to to bring part of the production back here. Yeah, because we have to disconnect ourselves from the French shoring, which does include the rest of the many countries around the globe, not only Latin America, to the New Year shoring, uh, uh, which would be ours. So uh, Mexico, of course, is is the you know the, the the bright light here in terms of the this actually happening. We have you know uh, information about land in, at the border being more expensive now, and warehouses trying to set up. Uh, uh, you know, locations there. So I wanted to ask you, Hans Antonio, if you think that this, uh, you know, the fact that Mexico is the powerhouse when it comes to trade in the region, really, um, if that is uh, supportive and helpful for other, for Central America, Northern Triangle to actually uh, join this ship or that, and also if we're going to create like a, you know, two blocks in the region, one heading north uh, to supply the U.S., and, and a, a separate one out, outboarding, so to speak, offshoring from uh, South America into Europe and other countries. I mean, do you see that Mexico could play that role in supporting the, um, uh, the, the, the development for Central and uh, Central American Northern Triangle? I think that we can, uh, and I think that there's lessons to be learned from, from the Mexican case. But but first, and I think in the context of geopolitics that, that Shannon mentioned, it's interesting to put Mexico in, in perspective more globally. And I think that when one does that, you get some interesting surprises. First off, Mexico and Russia's economy are roughly the same size. Russia is probably you know, 15 percent bigger than Mexico, and that that always seems to be surprising because of the I mean the obvious and, and the, the reasons why, why they do uh, it are obvious as well. Russia is more thought about in the geopolitical arena than Mexico is, but from the perspective of the economy, we're not really that dissimilar, with one exception: Mexico is much more global. So if if you wanted to do away if you wanted to make an exercise as to who would be more missed in, in the global economy, whether Mexico or Russia, Mexico would be severely more missed th than Russia. Being about 15% smaller, we actually export about 30% more th than, than, than Russia does. And being a big exporter as we were in 2018, with an even bigger one after COVID, which, which is quite surprising. And I think that that added to, to, the, to the North American regionalization process, really resilient uh, supply chains, which I think were very relevant. But if one looks at Mexico, we really picked up 
<clears throat> not because we were selling cheap labor, which which we, I mean, labor is is of course something that adds to, to our competitiveness, but something else adds to our competitiveness and that's energy. And if you look at what happened with the pipelines and, and with the gas lines in Mexico, we basically went from having you know, gas basically in, in, in Nuevo Leon uh, for, for many, many years. And that explains part of the entrepreneurial spirit that, that Nuevo Leon has to having gas in, in the northern part of Mexico all the way down to the Bajio. And if you look at the energy content of the Mexican export, it's about seven times the labor content of a Mexican export. So that shows, I think, that, that energy is key. So I, I, I think a long-hanging fruit and one that's in the interest of, of the US, should be in the interest of, of Canada, and it should be in the interest of Mexico as well, is getting those pipelines further down south. And I think that that, that would help, that gas lines, that would help the, the southern part of Mexico, but it would also bring into play the northern part of, of Central America. And, and these numbers I always found striking. There's this exactly the same number of Central Americans as there are Canadians. And, and you know, Central Americans you know, want to live like, like, like the Canadians do. And, and, and the right to have, I think, that those expectations and, and that aspiration. And I think that from a regional perspective, we would want to make it so that, that there is a possibility for Central America to be successful. And I think that the key to that is to get gas down into Central America. And if we do that, then the type of development that you could see in Central America not only would mirror the, 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 the Northern Mexico, but we would actually be able to compete as a region with many of the Southeast Asian uh, countries. So, so you would have, uh, if we are able to modernize the energy matrix of Central America, and that can only be done through Mexico and regionally because the, the, the most important component of that energy would, would be gas basically from Texas and but more, more broadly from the U.S., if one can, can bring Central America into the mix through a better energy matrix, I, I think that we would be sort of like, like in a new developmental story for the region and within the context of nearshoring, you would put into play a region that has potentially good logistics, lots of people that, that, that could, you know, that, that human capital could of course be improved, but that really provides, I think, a, a blockbuster of a region if we are able to get the, the Central America involved. And I think the low hanging fruit there and a the necessary condition at the same time is we need to modernize their energy matrix. And, and the best way to do it, I think, would be getting those gas lines down to southern Mexico and to the northern part of Central America. I'd be interested to say that it, see if the um, the supply chain memorandum that the U.S. just signed like a couple of days ago with Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, and Panama, if it, if it will go there, right? If it was it will work in in infrastructure issues or or just financing, you know, companies to set up. The IDB has a big program as well, mostly for Mexico, right? To 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 support financing of uh, of near shoring. So the it's been interesting to see if, how much of that actually goes into infrastructure. And then there's a question here. We have loads of questions, actually. People are really interested in this conversation because we have already a lot of questions coming from all ends here. So I want to get started and mixing them in because um, uh, Jose Rajiv Rios is just asking about the, uh, the, the this consultation of the USMCA, Canada and US into Mexico, what, you know, if that could have any bearing or if it could be a short-lived one or it could have any very impact on the on the process of near shore in Mexico. Shannon, do you, do you have a an insight um, on that? Sure, I think it, it does have an impact. It has a shorter term impact and then, and then a longer term impact. And, and I agree with Pepe that, you know, a more connected energy matrix is foundational to bringing this there. And, you know, the reasons behind this consultation or, or this question um, shows Mexico, at least right now, moving in the other direction, not as interested in connecting with its neighbors in, in the energy space, right? Or, or more broadly with the, with the you know, private sector and global community. So, so what does this mean? Well, it means first um, that you're seeing you know, a, a dispute and, and you know, that always worries companies and some companies, US companies, as well as European companies that feel that their, you know, their, their rights and their access and their level playing field and the things that you know, the treaty promises um, are not being kept. So you know, this will go through a process there's you know dispute mechanisms and the like, but but a real worry about those that will invest, um, particularly in the energy sector, um, whether or not they'll be able to do business as the way that they had thought they would be able to do. So that's that's one part. But for this broader vision that we're talking about here, 
Um, it relies on you know, plentiful, affordable, and increasingly clean energy. Um, and this dispute is fundamentally about those things. Will Mexico have plentiful, affordable, and clean energy in the future? And you know, if you don't turn toward renewables, if you don't build these pipelines, if you don't do all of these things, which you know, the public sector in Mexico really doesn't have the financing or the ca capacity to do, then you won't be able to attract manufacturing. And, and in part, um, you just won't have enough energy for the demand, right? You were talking about the, you know, the industrial zones in the north, you know, you can't find an industrial park where you can rent space because they're full. Well, all of those places are gonna need electricity. But the other thing that is changing rapidly around the world, um, and you see this in Europe, you see this in the US and other places, and you see this in company boardrooms is, all of the big Fortune 500 companies and others have made these climate pledges. And so they will not be able to produce things in places where they can't become carbon neutral, at least see the path to being carbon neutral in the next decade or two. Uh, and so that goes down to, is your electricity renewable or is most of it renewable? Um, and so that will be a real challenge. Um, now, the good thing for Latin America, and just to back up a little bit from Mexico itself, the good thing for Latin America is in terms of this green transition, they start from a pretty strong base. 50% right, electricity produced throughout the region is already green, so you're not trying to change it, you already have it. Um, you also have lots of countries that are incredibly bountiful in you know, sun, wind, geothermal, and other kinds of energy. So there's a lot to exploit there. The other side is many Latin American nations also have a lot of the minerals that are vital to the green transition. So you know, lithium and cobalt and manganese, and you name all these other ones that are vital for batteries and the like, they're actually big reserves in, in the Western hemisphere, bigger than lots of places around the world. So there's a lot to build on there, um, but you need the politics and the regulations and the laws to go that direction. And I would say at least right now, that isn't the direction that Mexico in particular is headed. Yeah, there's actually a question about that. How do you uh, equate that with the uh, with the energy reform or the uh, policy, energy policy in Mexico, the switch, so to speak? Um, and and Jose Antonio, that was actually coming straight to you specifically on that, and not only you know on the energy policy in Mexico, but also you know why the need for for um, gas pipelines and to to do to go through that sort of infrastructure in Central America as opposed to um, favoring uh, more more uh, greener energies as a way to, I mean, is that, would that choice either impact uh, this, this, you know, opportunity for Central America right now? Well, I think Central America has a lot of interesting examples in terms of renewables. I mean, you have countries that, that run almost fully on renewables like Costa Rica. And I think that that trend should continue. And I think that as Shannon said correctly, Latin America is blessed with a huge potential in terms of renewables. Just again, coming back to Mexico, the, the, one of the best zones in, in, in terms of wind is in Oaxaca, second only to one I think that is Argentina, but the Mexican one is closer. We have huge geothermal reserves, we have very good sun. I'd likely at some point we have huge coastlines, and, and that, that should prove also a, 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 a that should also prove to, to be, I think, part of, of, of the matrix going forward. But I think that we have to complement that with, with, with what we have. We have to take stock of, of where we are. And as, as where we are today, actually moving towards gas is actually going to make Latin America cleaner. I mean, the, uh, with the exception probably of Costa Rica, I think that if you include gas into the mix within the Central American context, that is going to actually result not only in, in cheaper energy, but cleaner energy as well. It, that you're probably not generating energy as cleanly as you could outside of the context part of countries like, like Costa Rica. So I think that we need to do both. We need to have more energy, better energy, cheaper energy, and, and clearly and without any doubt, a, a, a energy that, that's, that's renewable, that's clean, that's sustainable. And, and I think that, that Latin America has the potential to do all of that. And, and I'll touch a little bit upon the, 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 the consultation process because I, I think it's positive in, in, in the following sense. Mexico had an issue with pipelines at the beginning of this administration, and it was solved. And it was solved, uh, uh, I think, in, in a way where both the administration and, and the, the investors in the pipelines actually felt that the resolution had been a, an equitable uh, resolution for, for both. And in general, I think it's better where you can talk with countries than where you can talk about countries. And if you have a, a legal framework that's binding, that, that regulates that conversation, I think the end result would be very positive. And I think that, you know, USMCA needs to be reviewed in, in 2026. So the fact that we actually have an example 
of a process that, that actually makes you know, the countries and states able to talk in, in a structured and systemic fashion in, in order to drive, I think at the end, a policy that's better for the region, that I think is going to be a good test uh, for the treaty and that would prove the value for, for the, of the treaty to, to all of the parties involved. So, so I think that the fact that, that in this short period of time between it was when it was signed and 2026, when it will have to be reviewed, that we have this example of, of a structured dialogue that I am confident will result in, in, in something that's positive and clear uh, for the region. I, I think that that's actually I think that's actually good good news. And I think again, it's always better to talk with and to talk about, and this will get us as a region, I think, better results. And uh, I just wanna. Well, tangential, but also back a little bit because uh, Richard Feinberg sent us a note here saying that the, the Memorandum of Understanding uh, with uh, um, DR Costa Rica and Panama does uh, include prospective financing and support for infrastructure that includes energy and logistics. So that's, a, you know, which is definitely vital. So that's a good thing. But he also raises another issue, another topic here from before, which I actually wanted to go into with you, Shannon, because you do mention that in your article, which is the issue, uh, the, the question of intra-regional trade, which is puny, right? We have 15% uh, of all Latin American trade happens within the region. Um, he's raising, you know, what that, you know, what my question before, which sort of is tangential to what, to his point was like, if you had to do a policy choice today between focusing on improving regional trade as far as infrastructure and so on and so forth, or improving your chances of outbound uh, outside the region, uh, would that be, there, should there be a priority or was your, your point that inter-regional is sort of like a building block to get there? It is a building block. So Latin America trades, right? Um, the challenge is because it doesn't hook in with its neighbors when it trades. It usually, it ends up on the ends of the production. So it sends out the raw materials that it sends to China or Asia or the US or other places. And then it receives back the finished goods, the manufacturing goods, but very little of the value added of whatever product Latin Americans are buying is made in the region or is made with their neighbors. So things that come in imports compete rather than complement local manufacturing and goods. And that's where it sort of remained in part because you don't have the back and forth and I'm leaving Mexico and North America out of this, but especially in South America, you don't have that back and forth. And so, um, so there is trade, but because there isn't a regional aspect there, it has been much harder for Latin American nations to climb the value at its scale. And in fact, you see over those last 40 years, economies getting less diverse. Um, so more guided by commodities and more guided by a few industries rather than a much more diverse kind of uh, you know, deep economy in a sense. Um, you see, you know, what economists call premature deindustrialization. In fact, the two areas of the world that are suffering most from this are Latin America and Africa, where you see before they become high income countries, their manufacturing sectors are shrinking as a percentage of GDP. And now this was the path for the US, for Europe, for other places, the way you got to high income countries and for many countries in Asia, the way you got there is through manufacturing. In Latin America, at least in South America, is losing its manufacturing before it gets out of the middle income trap. Um, so that is to say, um, what is the priority? More trade is fine, but I think not just any kind of trade. I think this is where Latin America, at least parts of their economy um, or their planning needs to focus on how do we create, you know, how do we become manufacturers? How do we create value added jobs? How do we do some of the innovation and technological adaptation and adoption that we've seen in other countries that have allowed them to kind of scale up more quickly to leapfrog into other places. Um, and so that is what I would be as a policymaker thinking about how do you, it doesn't have to be the whole economy, right? And I would start in particular places where you might have a, you know, a comparative advantage, or you might have particular access to the US economy for the reasons we've talked about, plus you know, free trade agreements that you have. And Mexico has a free trade agreement, but 13 nations in Latin America have free trade agreements with the United States. It's one of the, you know, the US doesn't have a lot of free trade agreements, but the ones it does, a lot of them are in the Western hemisphere. So take that and, and do it with your neighbors. Cause there you'll have the economies of scale in terms of, you know, labor force and access to raw materials and market size and access to other markets um, that, that will allow you actually to, to compete, to compete with, you know, Asian supply chains, other regional supply chains that are already quite robust. Um, so that's a long way of saying, 
there is a focus on the regional aspect um, because you are trading with the world, but you're not trading with each other. And there are benefits that come from trade with each other um, that aren't being realized. Even on logistics, right? Make it faster for us to get around too. If you get <laughs> visit each other. Um, I mean, it, let me uh, just say on, on logistics. I mean, as anybody's traveled around Latin America knows, it's hard to get around. <laughs> Right? You know, flights don't go exactly where you want to go. You probably have to go back to Miami or if Stanley was here, he would tell us you can go through Panama City. But um, but but it's hard to get around. Right. You can't go from place to place. And that's just the flying. You look at roads and rails. You know, there's very few cross continent roads and rails that make it easy for people like us, but really that make it easy for, you know, for trucks, for the cargo, for the kinds of goods that we're talking about here. And then for ports. Um, you know, some of those need to be upgraded. They need to fit the big, you know, the big Panamax, you know, big size ships and the like. They haven't done that yet. But because of the different, you know, customs and bureaucracy and like between the ports, sometimes it's just cheaper to send your stuff out of the region than to keep it in the region. And all of that, getting rid of those frictions, those log logistics frictions would allow some of this regional trade. <laughs> Interesting, because yeah, I, I was based in so I am from Brazil. Was based in São Paulo for a while, and if I had, you have to go to to Santiago. I'm like, okay, let's move around, keep the through here, through there. Um, yeah, not not an easy one. But <laughs> Santiago, uh, 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 start with me because Mexico is probably the one that uh, within Latin America has the least uh, concern, so to speak, or problem with uh, um, um, lowering trade with China. But for the rest of the region, trade with China has become really, really major. So is there there is a question here that was about whether there is a concern of creating tension with China with this with increasing competition in manufacturing as part of nearshoring. But I want to understand whether I mean, if that could be China itself is is throwing is, is sending a lot of its uh, uh, smaller manufacturing out also because they're their workforce is more expensive now too, right? But um, also whether their voracious appetite for everything uh, that Latin America had to offer actually sort of skewed the balance so strongly and that it kind of took the um, focus from in the region from manufacturing. Brazil and Argentina were um, um, trade partners that actually ex uh, exchanged uh, manufacturing product, manufactured products. So, what with China sort of like growing at a much um, uh, lower, you know, a uh, slower rate, can that help in a certain way of improving situation in Latin America for allowing these uh, countries to actually uh, um, have to diversify? I, th I think it's a very important question and a very interesting one. I think the lowest of the hanging fruits in terms of Latin America integration is for the US to look more at Latin America. Uh, I think in a way, some of the advantages of, of Latin America it have been downplayed by, by, by the U.S. We're, we're geopolitically very stable. The, the type of issues that, that, you know, that the U.S. has with Latin America don't compete and don't compare with the complexity of some of the issues that they have you know, with Russia, with China, with, with, with the Middle East. And maybe that means that they, they don't put enough attention, they don't put enough scope as to how to build not only a physical infrastructure, but even a legal infrastructure to, to, to improve the, 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 sort of the integration process. The lowest of, of the hanging fruits, and, this, and people that know we always think it's a, it's a pet peeve, but Mexico and the US should have reversible lanes at the border. I mean, the, the, the flows are dramatically predictable. No? We go there in the morning and then come back at night. And if we made those lanes reversible, that would have an impact in climate change and in emissions. And that would appear to be you know, very low hanging. But in order to solve that issue, we would need to solve many of the issues that Shannon put forth. The, the paperwork would have to be the same. The, the inspection processes would have to be the same. Uh, uh, we would have to, to, to make it homogeneous so that the same, only one set of eyes would look at trade and immigration issue. But if we were able to do that and show that as an example, then that could trickle down into, into Latin America and bring the integration process forward. You need both. You need, you need legal, inter, legal infrastructure, you need physical infrastructure, and, and you need some quality dialogue, and, and you need to spend time within the region. So I think that one of the lowest hanging fruits is for the US to recognize that Latin America has a lot to offer, that, that it's a region you're largely at peace, 
with, as Shannon said, huge natural resources, uh, where you know, trade ha has caught on in countries such as Mexico. And when it hasn't caught on, we can actually understand why and make it better so that they can integrate it in a more reasonable fashion. But I think that that hasn't been the case, at least not systemically. And, and we're missing an opportunity to really consolidate a region that, that's prosperous, that's a peace, that has you know, great demographics, that has great natural resources, and, and you know, th that could over time develop into having better human capital, better quality institutions, better quality democracy. And um, yeah, that will be a good result. <laughs> but uh, you mentioned, both of you touched on the issue of the, the environmental and, and energy, and that's an opportunity. But of course, the region is known as an opportunity for a generation of, because of, um, um, as somebody joked, a stock of wind, but it is. I mean, we have wind in stock and, um, and you know, oceans water. So there's so many options there. But there's a question here that I thought was interesting from Carla Bass from uh, Argus Media. She was asking about interested in renewable uh, uh, transition energy, solar panels, battery, etc. as implements, as the region actually putting there. How, how much would that be? Is that a low hanging fruit or is that just political will to get there? We had Argentina talking about having a lithium group with, uh, with uh, Chile and Bolivia, but then, you know, we're still just getting the lithium. Can we do the batteries? Can we uh, um, build those humongous um, uh, blades that are needed for, for wind farms? Do we have a chance of getting there? Is that something that we, that the region is, would that be a logo hanging for, for the region given that we have the capacity for generation also to produce the implements needed for that uh, industry? Shannon. So I think there's two answers to this or two, two avenues into it. One is, you know, Latin America produces a lot of these raw inputs, you know, they have the, the mining and stuff. And I do think a step for local governments is how do you go to the next value out of state? So not just mining the lithium, but why don't you process the lithium, right? And so I think those are areas where it makes sense on kind of a value chain, take the next step and, and add that. And, you know, there's um, there's companies that you could work with to do that, whether they're local companies or international companies, but I think that is one side. The other side, and just sort of uh, following up on what Jose Antonio just talked about, is, is the U.S. and the U.S. interest. Because I think some of this, you need an outside catalyst, and the U.S. is a good outside catalyst, one, because it's still the world's largest consumer market, um, and two, it is thinking a lot about particular strategic industries and, and the green transition, right? And particularly right now, you see a lot of that movement. So there is a, an interest in forwarding a green transition around the world, but particularly in the United States and Western Hemisphere, as well as this worries. And some of that overlaps with, you know, critical minerals and, and critical technologies, green technologies being sort of national security interests, at least in some of the conceptions here in the United States. So given all of that, you have, you have an interest in the United States in, in doing that. And I think the challenge is, but which could happen is, expanding that aperture beyond just reshoring to the United States, which we will quickly find out we can't bring everything back here for you know, labor reasons, for land reasons, for environmental permitting reasons, for all kinds of reasons, we can't do it. Um, and thinking more broadly about where we can make sure that there are secure supply chains for the things that we want here in the United States, but that also help other countries. And you know, I would say um, in the Summit of the Americas in, in June, you know, one of the announcements that was made is that there's going to be an America's partnership, uh, economic partnership, somewhat similar to the IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that was put out. Now, there is nothing on the bones of this, really. It's the idea that we're for countries in the region that want to work with us, we'd like to lay out a, a number of pillars. There'll be green pillars and digital trade pillars and in standard setting pillars and some others. Uh, and I actually think this is a huge opportunity in the next couple of years. Um, for the U.S., but really guided by Latin American countries that want to come to the table. Okay, we'd like to make this transition. This is what we need. We need financing. We need loan guarantees. We need, you know, technical planning. We need, there's a lot of things we need. So whether working with the U.S. government, with the IDB, with other multilaterals, I do think there is a space here um, to, to pick a couple projects to start moving down that path. And so down the road, maybe you do make the, you know, wind turbine blades and the like, but you, you sort of have to start somewhere. And I think um, this is going to be a big issue. I mean, the other, some of this stuff though, just as you know, we're talking, you know, there, there's opportunities here, but some of this stuff is incredibly complicated because 
it's not just one piece. It's not just we need to steal for the wind tower and learn. It's all of these parts. Um, and the ecosystem, the supply chain ecosystem has been pretty robustly developed in other places. And so you're, you're talking about a much more complicated process than just setting up one factory. And we need transmission lines and we need a lot more for this to come uh, reality. And those wind, wind blades, they are humongous. Yeah. I mean, shipping them across the world is already crazy on its own because they're really big. I was really surprised when I saw the first one in person, <laughs> but they, you know, it's, it's something that we're shipping big things across the globe. Like if it was nothing as we're shipping little, little things that we could be doing or not, but then comes an oil shock and then we'll see oil going at the roof. And then the reality right now is that the world's matrix is still oil based, right? It's fossil fuel based still. So that transition also needs to happen for even for Latin America to have who to sell things to uh, as well. So it's not an immediate thing. And then we have um, global inflation that's sort of like a, a byproduct of, of a, a lot of it, what we're talking right now. So Jose Antonio, this the reality of global inflation right now is that uh, is that a step on the brakes of of the potential for nearshoring? Do you have to wait for everything to sort of like calm back down, or or it's we're talking only about long term investments that won't you know won't respond to that? Is global inflation a major hurdle? Well, I think the, the macroeconomic situation globally is as complicated as, as I've seen it probably much more complicated today than it was in 2008 and 2009. Every time the U.S. tightens, something in the world breaks. Mexico had difficulties in 82 and 94. Asia Pacific had difficulties in 97. The dot-com sector had difficulties in 2000. Everybody had difficulties in 2008, 2009. So every time the U.S. tightens, that, that, that creates complications globally. And I don't think that that's, that's going to be the exception. So I think that the macro, the, the macro stance for, for emerging markets is going to be very difficult. It's very hard to disentangle the, the monetary policy of the emerging markets from the tightening that the, the Fed is following. So we're going to see at least the, the level of interest rate that we have in the U.S. plus the differentials that we had to start out with, and some of those differentials were pretty big. So I think that the, the, the sort of the environment for global growth is going to be complicated. But having said that, the, this complicated environment for global growth actually sends the right signals in terms of how important it is to, to have better regional integration. Because uh, you, you, of course, can combat inflation through, through increasing the interest rate, but you can also combat inflation by making your, structurally the economies more competitiveness. So I think there's going to be a drive, or hopefully there will be a drive, to make the Latin American region more competitive as a way to, to sort of face the, the challenges of inflation. Because if we only face them through the interest rate, we're going to be challenged for growth for a long time. So improving the structure of our economy, improving access to, to goods and services to our population, all of that I think has an ingredient of good of good public policy that should be brought about because of this disruption and because of these challenges. Uh, going back to, to, to the, the energy uh, to the energy scenario, the price signals that we are now seeing because of expensive fossil fuel actually make renewables not only good because of the environment, but also cost efficient. Because from a technological perspective, the prices that we are now seeing in oil actually drive innovation and make it obvious that, that renewables are the way to go going forward. So I think it's going to be difficult. I think the macro stance is going to be complicated. I think global growth is going to be subdued to say the very least. But I think that precisely that environment shows why it is important to engage in good, sound, structural reforms so that trade and nearshoring and, and, and your, this regionalization actually provide better results this time around than it did the last time. Yeah. Susie, let me just add, I agree with all of that, but I think right now in the short term on inflation, um, it is global, but not so much in China. Um, right? China actually is not having the inflationary effects yet, um, that rest of the world. And so as you think about moving in and out of China, that makes it stickier to stay in China because you have a much better handle on your cost structure um, because it's not moving as quickly as it is in some other places in the world. But partly because growth there is already subdued as yes. compared 
Right. To, to Unemployment rates are high. Right. There's a lot of reasons why it's lower. And it doesn't mean it's all it's going to stay that way. But at yeah. least right now, if you're making a decision 12 months out to move or not, um, that, that will factor into your decisions. Or at least on how soon are you going to do? Because if you're talking about moving manufacturing, it's it's not a simple decision for tomorrow. And you have to have a long term. And I was just going to say, well, at least it's global, not only located, but it, as, you, as you point out, there's one good part of the globe that is not having that impact. Uh, we, we, there's some. Uh, there's a question here that I thought that was interesting. It was like, can can we re, renew the free trade agreement of the Americas, the FDAA? I'm like, I think I, it, yeah, I don't think that has a chance right now. But it will be interesting to see what. We have a lot of changes happening in the region in terms of, of um, policymakers, right? We have this anti-incumbent feeling that, you know, that's sort of like persistent across the region. So we've been having this back and forth between, you know, a wave to the left, a wave to the right, a wave to the left. And apparently that's where we're going right now. But it seems that um, those political ways back and forth impede at a certain level, inter-regional end trade as a whole, just because it makes it harder makes the conversation harder, right? Few countries have that f- ease of discussing with countries that are not aligned ideologically. I would say Pacific Alliance was very cool that I thought they continued to work even when they were completely different. But anyway, it's sort of like what, what if anything, do you expect from this new wave? So we have, you know, a few years now with where we're going to be, have, you know, have a, a larger cohort of left-leaning um um, countries, if that is in any way, shape, or form, you know, indicative of what we can expect as far as picking those low-hanging fruit. Who wants to pick that one? <laughs> Shannon, you want to well, start? Let, 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 yeah. let, let, let me take a crack at it. it, it I, I think it, it gets us it's almost securely, and, and it's, it's good as, as, as time is starting to go out, to, to take us almost back to the beginning. We need to do better in Latin America. And I think that there are some things that you can expect out of trade, and there are some things that you can't. And I think that we need to take stock as to what was done right, where were those good results, why were those good results achievable, and where where did we fail? And and you can't really sustain democracy, liberal democracy, with the level of discontent that you were seeing in Latin America. And that level of discontent was present in Mexico. It was present in in Colombia. It was present in Chile. It was present in Argentina. So I think that we have to to take stock as to what were the sources of that discontent and what we need to do better from a policy perspective so that we actually get political support for good policy. I don't think that we can expect just to improve the discourse. I don't think it was just communication. I think we need we need better policy to drive better politics. And I think that that starts with a sort of exam of your conscience in, in terms of what we did well. And many things I think were done well, but where, there were shortcomings. And I think in many cases, there were brutal shortcomings. And, and I think that we need to do better if we want to get you know, the, the political support for some of these ideas that in the recent past were not as inclusive as we would have needed them to be. You know, let me. Do you I, see I, FTAA I as that. a possibility? Sorry, like yeah. reviving the FTAA? Either one of you sees it as a possibility? Not if you want the U.S. involved in it. So, <laughs> sorry to say, the U.S. is not in a free trade moment. So, um, I think I think it'd be hard. You know, let me add. I mean, as I look at at the wave of, of new leadership coming in in Latin America. I see it uh, more as anti-incumbent than leftist. Um, And where it is quote unquote leftist, I see very different kinds of leftists, right? So you have a, you know, in Mexico, you have a social conservative economic nationalist um, who is not particularly open um, to, you know, women's rights or gay rights or environmental rights. Um, In Chile, you have a, you know, progressive millennial that's very environmentally friendly, gay, women friendly. It's, you know, very progressive social agenda that, you know, you would see in the U.S. And one who is pretty open, it seems so far, and working with the private sector and working through democratic institutions. So, you know, if you read a newspaper, an international newspaper, they'll say they're both leftists, but they're very different animals, I would say. And so I think as we look at, you know, what is the possibility for nearshoring? What is the possibility for trade under new leadership? I think it really depends on, on what the anti-incumbent move is. So, you know, for instance, um, Brazil has a big election coming up, Cecilia, you're, you know, your home country. 
Uh, as I look at you know a potential Lula administration, let's say there's an anti-incumbent wave there, and we see a, a you know a new a new anti-incumbent come in. Um, I actually see more opening for, for trade. I see potential unlocking of the EU Mercosur agreement that's in the deep freeze because of the current administration's sort of you know, ESG stances and deforestation stances. I think there might be some space for more trade um, and, and rules um, that open up Brazil a bit more than we've seen in the past. In Chile, you know, Boric is having a, a rough time of it, but I, but I do see a government that's trying to work through and create new institutions through democratic channels. And so if that happens, I think actually Chile will be a much more stable place to do business. The rules will be different than they were under the you know, previous Pinochet, you know, constitution set by Pinochet and that government, but, but will have become out of social consensus in a way that would be there for, for the longer haul. Um, you know, Colombia is making its shift. We'll see what the new government um, comes out, but there's been you know, moves towards the center, at least in the, in the campaign and in the, the post period. And you know, even in, in Peru, where you have you know, a lot of political instability, um, you know, a lot of the kind of free market rules have, have really remained in place. So, um, so you know, I think some of this actually allows this opening for the nearshoring, the trade, the kinds of things we're talking about, that you're not seeing so much change in those spaces. But of course, with the you know with the the caveat and often in, in you know really thinking about what Jose Antonio just said is that the reason you got anti incumbents is because people were frustrated with with the, their life and their opportunities and sort of how they saw the future going and all of these governments are going to need to answer that in some way shape or form um, if they if they want to continue and provide some more stability. We just have a few minutes left, Jose Antonio. I don't know if you want to add um, anything to that. To, to, yeah, I, to, was, I was just going through, through the questions and answers. And I think there's reason to, to end on, on optimism. We're going to share a, a World Cup with the US and Canada. So, so, so that means that the North American spirit is still alive. <laughs> We're integrated uh, there, at least. <laughs> exactly. I'm looking forward to that one. That's for sure. I'll be integrated into that one. That, uh, thank you so much. Uh, there were a lot of questions actually about tangible examples of, uh, of nearshoring actually happening. So I would say go to the website, go to americasquarterly.org because the, the new issue actually, we did find some examples and uh, both you know, the articles that you read there also uh, uh, refer to, to, to a few areas where things are happening. So it's not all lost and we're gonna go there. The only question here that was not an integration is like, we, is it gonna be ProSur, Unasur, Silac, which, <laughs> which alphabet soup is gonna be raining next time? Just kidding. Well, thank you so much, Jose Antonio Mead, Shannon O'Neill. You're both a fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for everybody that participated. There were so many questions. I'm sorry, I was not able to get to everything because there were a lot of questions, but I just want to thank everybody for participating. This is an ongoing conversation, and I'm sure there will be a lot more for us to, to learn and discuss on this topic going forward. Make sure to check America's Quarterly and tweet at us and send your questions, and we'll, we'll continue the conversation going forward. Forward. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you all. Gracias. Bye, Shannon. Bye, Cecilia. Bye. Good well, wishes.